to today's poetry session, Four Voices, Two Horizons. My name is Garma Pant, and I work in the cultural section of the Embassy of Mexico in New Delhi. I'm very excited to be hosting this session, co-organized by the Embassy and the Executive Directorate of Cultural Diplomacy, under the direction of Dr. Enrique Marquez, and within the framework of the first international festival of poetry, La Poesia Salvará al Mundo, or Poetry Will Save the World 2021. First of all, on behalf of Ambassador Federico Salas, I would like to thank today's poets for accepting this invitation and for being with us today from different parts of the world. When we first began to conceptualize the session, we planned to centrate on themes like the reappropriation of the word, the female corporality, and the lines that divide the visible and the invisible in, in poetry. We immediately decided that we wanted four pulsating female voices that explore these concepts in their works, whose uh, poetic ink reveals the concealed, who make their internal geography a place of revelation, and who seamlessly inhabit through the lines, the physical and the inner world. Most fortunately, all of them accepted and they are with us today. They are Ana Belen Lopez, Usha Kela, Arundhati Subramanyam, and Elsa Cross. I'm also glad to share that our poetic journey today will be accompanied by a photographic essay by Francisco Cochin and a Bansuri recital by Natalie Ramirez. Both have generously agreed to engage in visual and musical dialogues with our dear poets and their works and have specially curated several pieces for this occasion. So without further ado, let us begin this session with the first poet for today's session, Ana Belen Lopez. Ana Belen is a Mexican poet and editor and currently a professor of literature at the Professional School of Dance in Mazatlan. She is the author of four books of poetry, Alejandro Se Avanza, Drifting Off Trison, Del Barandal, From the Railing, Silencios, Silences, and Retrato Hablado, Spoken Portraits, that have been translated into several languages. Since 2001, she has been collaborating with the column Imagines Sueltas, Loose Images, in the Mazatlan-based paper Noroeste. Ana, Please tell us about the poems that you will be reciting today, how you selected them, why you selected them before the recital. Okay, uh, do you prefer in English? It's okay for me. Well, yes, whichever language you prefer. Okay. But the recital can be done, the recital can be done in the original language. Okay, um, I chose this, oh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to be here with such a wonderful poets. Thank you, thank you so much. And this is only possible because of the pandemia, but it's one, one of a good things, <laughs> only <laughs> very, very few. But I'm very happy to be here. And when Santiago asked me to be here, I chose these poems first because they were very well translated. I love them, how they sound in English by a young poet of the America, of the United States, Ryan Green. And it was because I work uh, these poems with a very, very good dance con uh, company of uh, contemporary dance. And we did this job together. It's about the, the pain of solitude, I could say. So they are very, um, you know, it is a, a, a theme, but I would rather them to speak for me. If you want, I could read them. 
I'm ready. <laughs> sure, please go ahead. Uno. Espejos. Me hundo en la plata líquida del espejo para preguntarme, ¿dónde dejé mi cuerpo? ¿Dónde mi boca y lengua? ¿Quién soy en el codo prestado? ¿Dónde mis labios? ¿Dónde mis brazos, mis rodillas arrebatadas? Me hundo en el mar del otro para descubrir que mi cuello no me pertenece, que en sus manos quedaron los pedazos de mi piel y mi pecho que crece entre su boca. Mis dedos huyen hacia el otro para rascar el recuerdo de mí mismo, el recuerdo que se ahoga en el fuego, entre la luz de la ventana, entre la plata líquida del espejo. Therefore, so I've been reading next. Dos. Sequía. La espera se acumuló en mi estómago, en mis pies y en mi pelo. Serían solo dos meses. Pero las redes caen sobre mí como el tiempo que corre por la casa, con la luz, con el viento, con el agua salada que me arrastra en mi propio mar. Los barcos llegan en la madrugada luego de navegar toda la noche. El tren pasa al mediodía. Las llantas levantan polvo de arena a la distancia. Sus sonidos se mezclan en mi espera, en los minutos que se empalman, en la ventana, entre mi piel, entre mis pies, entre mi pelo, mis labios, mis ojos, la mirada que persigue un horizonte que no se acaba nunca. Tres. Naufragio. Estas palabras no te alcanzarán jamás. Caerán sobre tu piel, sobre tus hombros, sobre tus pies. Como una red resbalarán por tu espalda estas palabras. Tus oídos cubiertos de agua no podrán escuchar los balbuceos que te escribo. La luz cegará tu mirada en la memoria, en la curva de tus manos en los dedos que las acaricien, sin alcanzarte, caerán estas palabras, se mezclarán entre el agua de tu silencio y tu saliva. No te alcanzarán estas palabras, ni la luz, ni el sonido del viento que se hunde por la ventana. No te alcanzarán estas palabras, como tampoco yo las puedo tocar, porque mi cuerpo duerme para olvidar el silencio de tu cuerpo flotando en el mar. Y por último, cuatro, la carta. La clavícula entendió antes que yo. Ese pedazo de hueso que protege mi corazón entendió antes que yo. Entendió antes que mi mirada, que mi olfato, antes que mi piel se erizara. La clavícula supo antes que mis lágrimas se derramaran por la cara y los labios ahogaran mi grito. Supo antes que mis ojos leyeran la carta. Supo que no volverías nunca cada vez que abría y cerraba la ventana. Y aún así, se quedó quieta para siempre entre las paredes mojadas, oscuras y calladas de la noche. Muchas gracias.
is another poet whose poems are are marked with with powerful imagery that often catches you off guard uh, she is usha kela uh, usha is the uh, author of nine books that include poetry and musical dramas her next book i will not bear you sons is due from spinifex press australia and her last book the waiting was published by the sahitya academy the indian Ac national academy of letters and was translated by elsa cross who's also with us here today in to spanish in 2019 she is the founder of matwala the poetry festival promoting visibility of south asian diaspora poets and hosts the interview and conversation website the pov Usha, please introduce us to the poems that you've selected for today. Thank you, uh, Garima. Namaskaram to everyone. Uh, I'm absolutely honored to be here, part of this historic reading by Indian and Mexican women poets for the Mexican Embassy in India. Thank you, Santiago and Garima once again, and Elsa Cross for this kind invitation. Uh, overall, the poems I've chosen explore the theme of the spatial terrain and the power of poetry and the poet. There's no space that poetry does not inhabit and no border that a poet cannot cross. I'd like to begin with a poem titled Jerusalem. Jerusalem, shall I dare say your tales with this foreign tongue? as I spin like a top in your streets? Shall I enter your gates as you lie under the fingertips of a golden menorah? What badge shall I show your armed men keeping peace? When I listen to a mother calling for her children in fields of invisible ears and tongueless tongues, and old walls tremble with secrets, flags, and birds, and time the deathless watchman prowls your streets. When the mint in your tea refreshes my tongue and bread fills my stomach, and I walk, walk the walk of Via Dolorosa on the palm of the city pointing different directions with more than one minotaur at its center. When I climb Mount Olives and see dead men waiting like chocolates in boxes to be opened, when I see the impatience and the impatience of waiting, and prophets' names too many to remember cast shadows on your streets, shall I ask for permission to enter? Shall I dare stand by a wall, join lines of people in eternal mourning? Yearning shall I join my grief to theirs and ask for temples to be built. Idol of idols, how shall I gain entry? You the navel of this earth where people rooted to salt, faith, loyalty three times over, like three rivers flowing separately between your messianic apocalyptic banks. What message can I bring as balm for your wounds? All messages are known to you. They are coded in your stones in the cursive of prophets. City of walls, stones, earth, restoration, air, light, sky, blood, hope, tears, wail, lament. City of streets wagging many languages, where past, present, future coexist as solemn triplets. Shall I dare change the cartography of religion, stand under the golden dome, and let fly a new litany longing to be rewritten? My second poem uh, comes from my experience of a poetry festival in Medellin. To experience the living presence of poetry, I felt one must go to the Median Poetry Festival, for it is there that I grasp the reappropriation of the word and through it my place in the world as a poet. This poem is called Umbrellas. It seems like a city in which you find love young before death finds you on the street. This poet, what is he saying? 
his words so sure like granite i understand nothing except that a poet speaks poetry and i am listening hard when he turns a page it could be a page from his life chosen to be sacrificed his hand moves on the page moves like a scorpion full of ink or like a bird scattering seeds in the audience there is a girl showing off her pink painted lips flamingos are born from them and stride in the throngs a poet speaks of her love for beirut the translator holds two versions like two neighborhoods in a city young faces like full moons bob in the crowd celebrate the young ones here send death packing with his many faces a couple under the umbrella she rests her head on his shoulder sometimes a shoulder is a wall does she know this shall the poet lean on the wall of the world for comfort why does one man have courage the other not a mother and daughter are garlanded with poetry this evening the lebanese poet says today my life is mine the crowd goes wild the rain comes down savagely umbrellas open like sunflowers in the dark turning their faces to unseen suns the dark is like a silent bat the people stay under the umbrellas let the alphabet of faces speak a new script the people come keep coming from the stairs from the earth from the sky the rain pours the people do not move you are the poems says one poet they go wild the rain brings a river from the sky a river of images and a river of people and a river of poets and a river of faces there is no shore poetry does not die this evening as love does not die in hate as peace does not die in war the third poem i dedicate to elsa cross my very dear friend who translated uh, the waiting into spanish last year the poem is untitled i am with you doesn't suffice you must know this the architecture of the body mind seeking the comfort of form the yearning of the bones for music the eye for light phantoms and what's wrong temple too they call this clay haven't you known separation from your master you too became a stone cleaved from a mountain stunned in grief for years you were silent you watched the universe everything became a song in you you sing me now as an unhummed melody it happened the silence grew and became a lake in me within inside something like that the lake was you i was a ripple i was a dent in your bowl it was everything this obliteration and not to leaf dropped then the last poem um is a celebration of kamla harris for the space she's occupied heralding a new note in american history the name of the poem is she's speaking with an epigraph quoting kamla harris's response to winning the election she said i didn't listen and the people didn't listen either and we won the knee of a sown conscience compressed the country's gullet the country a vulva cleaved in two a salvo of wounds burgeon from the fruiting body of one heart the alphabet fell from her garland these streets ledgers of lies and unbalanced history you sprang from the house of triangles rising with the sap of two bloods a smile sure as the stalk of a lotus spoke with a voice corded with the sinews of voices before you for the petal voices to be wield the thunderbolt of athena guide our hand to pen new anthems be the lungs for a forgotten dream color the white house with holy colors 
help women sleep in their bed blanketed with stars, bathed in the nectar of skin. Let hope again be a majestic elephant, fertilize our awakening with your petals. Show us how from mud we can rise. Teach us in your chant, we did it, we did it, we do. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Usha. If, if there's another way the inner world connects to the outer, it's probably through recognition of emotions in others. And a poet or, or an empath looks from a distance, a poet also looks from within. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your poems with us. Thank, thank you. Our next poet has been described as one of the finest poets writing in India today by the Hindu. Arundhati Subramaniam is a leading Indian poet, editor, and author of 12 books of poetry and prose. She has been widely translated and anthologized and won numerous awards of prestige. As poet, her most recent work is Love Without a Story, published by Blood Axe Books. As editor, the acclaimed Penguin Anthology of Indian Sacred Verse, Eating God, and as prose writer, the best-selling Penguin biography of a contemporary mystic, Sadhguru More Than Alive. Let's hear from Arundhati. Thank you, Garima. And it's been wonderful listening to uh, the poets before me, Anna and Usha, and I look forward to Elsa. Uh, I just want to say, I'm not going to introduce uh, the poems in general, Garima. I just want to say something about each poem before I read it. And I think it will be apparent why I've made these choices that I have. Please but I want to start by just thanking you for making this happen. And uh, I know convergences like this don't come easy. So grateful for this. I'm going to start with the very first poem in my recent collection, which is a poem called, I Grew Up in an Age of Poets. And it has an epigraph by the well-known Indian poet Eunice D'Souza. I don't know how many of you have uh, admired the work of a poet and then made the mistake of meeting her or him. <laughs> and it can sometimes be an anticlimax from which it can take a lifetime to recover. So Eunice very wisely says, best to meet in poems. And that's the epigraph. I grew up in an age of poets. I grew up in an age of poets who would have me believe the joy was for cabbages. Until I found that beneath their smoking empires of sulfur, there lay a shiver of doubt. That they wondered, as I did, about what it might mean to be leafy, to wilt, to be damaged sometimes by upstart caterpillars and still stay green, chaotically, wetly, powerfully green. Now, I meet poets who exchange visiting cards, our best friends with the dentist, all dankness deodorized, their poems, cool seashells, their laughter, 
splintered eggshells, poets who never seem to wonder about cabbages at all. Still best to meet in poems. And I want to move on to a poem from my previous collection. I've always been fascinated by the fact that, um, and excited by the fact that I live in a subcontinent uh, with this extraordinary freedom, um, spiritual freedom, that allows you the choice of 330 million gods and goddesses. You can choose one that's most suited to your taste. If you don't find one, you can invent one. And if you don't want to invent one, you can dismiss the entire pantheon and still continue on a spiritual journey towards your own liberation. This idea of the Ishta Devta, the personal God, the God as ally and companion that you can love and quarrel with and dispense with and never stop loving is something that I find uh, really an extraordinary inheritance and so I tried to explain the idea to an Italian friend. And when I didn't get through, I wrote a poem. How some Hindus find their personal gods. It's about learning to trust the tug that draws you to some shadowed alcove, undisturbed by footfall and butter lamps. A blue, dark coolness where you find him waiting patiently. That perfect minor deity, shy, crumbly, oven fresh, just a little wry, content to play a cameo in everyone's life but your own. A God who looks like he could understand errors in translation, blizzards on the screen, gaps in memory, lapses in attention, who might even learn by rote the fury, the wheeze, the pali, the pigeon, the gnashing mixer grinder, the awkward Remington stutter of your heart, who could make them his own. After that, you can settle for none other. It always seems to me that there are poets or at least writers who espouse various uh, political causes deeply and strongly. I've written my share of overtly political poems. And yet there are times when I wonder if there is any particular constituency that would make the mistake of electing me as its representative. Uh, probably not. But it took me time to figure out what my potential tribe might be. And after a long while, I decided to write a quiet anthem to my people. Some of you may belong to this group. I speak for those with orange lunchboxes. I speak for those with orange lunchboxes who play third tree in an orchard of eight in the annual school play, who aren't head girls, games captains, class monitors, who watch other girls fight for the seesaw from the far wall across the sand pit, who remember everyone's lines but their own, who pelt after the school bus their mother's breakfast still lurching in their gut, who still believe there'll be exams one day that they'll be ready for, those with orange lunch boxes. I speak for them. And maybe it's because I live in a subcontinent that's always reminding itself of its ancient history. There are times I've wanted a sense of belonging that doesn't seem weighed by the cargo of the past. Home. Give me a home that isn't mine, where I can slip in and out of rooms without a trace never worrying about the plumbing, the color of the curtains, the cacophony of books by the bedside, a home that I can wear lightly, where the rooms aren't clogged with yesterday's conversations, where the self doesn't bloat to fill in the crevices 
a home like this body, so alien when I try to belong, so hospitable when I decide I'm just visiting. And I will conclude with a poem that was for me an important one from an early book. It was an important one at the time. I grew up in Bombay. Much of my early work happened around the 1980s and 90s. And that was the time when poetry was emphatically not the glamorous thing that it sometimes seems to be today. And well, that's debatable, but it's certainly much more glamorous than it is uh, now. So, or much less glamorous. So there are times when poets get together that becomes an interesting occasion to wonder why on earth they're writing poetry. I've done my share of that. You wonder why you're not doing something more lucrative, more glamorous, more high profile. And then of course you go home and write a poem. For a poem still unborn. Over tea we wonder why we write poetry. 10 people read it anyway. Three are committed in advance to disliking it. Three feel a vague pang, but have leaking taps and traffic jams to think about. Two like it and wouldn't mind telling you so, but don't know how. Another is busy preparing questions about pat ironies and identity politics. The tenth is wondering whether you wear contact lenses. And we, as soiled as anyone else, in a world addicted to carbohydrates and conversations without pauses, still groping among sunsets and line lengths and slivers of hope, for a moment unstained by the wild contagion of habit. Thank you. Lovely, lovely. Thank you, Arundhati. Thank you for indulging us with, with these ever so reflexive yet ironical poetry that you write. And it just moves you to question uh, things, bond with yourself, even laugh at yourself, and somehow makes you feel less alone. Well, it, it made me feel less alone. I can't speak for others. So thank you so much. And this, this quest, uh, whether personal or spiritual in Arundhati's poems, brings us to the next and last poet for today's session, who has been described by none other than Octavio Paz, the great Mexico Mexican poet, as one of the most personal voices in Latin American poetry, Elsa Cross. Elsa Cross is a Mexican poet, essayist, and translator whose vast career spans five decades. She has a doctorate in philosophy and letters from the National University of Mexico, UNAM, and is currently a professor in that faculty. 
Elsa is considered an authority on Indian philosophy and has written over four books of poetry of, about India and translated various mystical classical poets from the country. She has been awarded many prizes, including the National Award for Poetry, poetry Aguas Calientes, 1990, and the National Award for Poetry, Jaime Sabines, 1992. Elsa, welcome, and I invite you to share your verses with us. Thank you so much, Garibe. I'm very glad to be here and share with such with poets this uh, session. And the poems I will read are about India. I've been many times to India. I even uh, lived for two years there. And I feel India as dear and as close to me as my own country. And thank you, Chef, for your poem. Thank you, Elsa. So, uh, first poem is Holi in Jaipur. El día ahuyenta presagios. Las cometas ondean por encima de los palacios rosados. El viento gime entre las celosías. En la punta del ala, así vivimos. Las mujeres vuelven de la fuente con sus cántaros de cobre. El aire de la mañana aísla sus gritos, nombres, hormigas de luz. Las cometas de colores reciben la primavera y sobre el techo de lámina las patas de las palomas, telegrafías. En la punta del ala el instante nos llena del sabor del amor y el sabor del temor, fiebre indistinta por la muerte o la vida. El vigía. En los confines de la aldea los, os, los dos ojos brillan desde la piedra anaranjada. Varas de incienso detenidas en una rajadura del suelo. Los ojos interrogan desde la piedra y el rostro que se mira en el espejo no sabe quién lo habita. Vivo mi muerte, me miro a hacer sentir, quedo envuelta en mi red, me miro a mí misma desde arriba como un vigía. Los ojos juntados de un guento resguardan la aldea. Pronto, dicen sus voces, antes de que se acorte el día y en la penumbra que tiende ya sus lazos, se sequen nuestras manos. Paranasi. Eh. Leo solo dos fragmentos de este poema. Restos de una barca se mecen en la orilla. La carena erizada de musgo. Pequeños cangrejos rondan al pie de los peñascos. La hora disipa velos en la otra ribera. Así emerge el pensamiento de su turba de imágenes, gana claridad, llega a su centro y se interroga. ¿Qué queda en pie cuando eres arrebatado de tus sueños y te dejan la eternidad entre las manos? 
Oh Shiva, Mahakana, he seguido tus huellas. Busqué tu rostro en los templos y los ríos, en lugares ocultos donde dejaba flores sobre tu imagen. Te busqué en la piedra que surge de la tierra por calles cubiertas de estiércol y vi que eras tú quien me seguía. Mahakana, se marcan tus huellas en mis manos, tus uñas trazan líneas en mi cara, tu aliento vuelve mi cabello gris. Oh, mi amor, devores mi carne poco a poco. Mahakala, me fundirás contigo en tu abrazo de fuego. Mi cráneo será la copa donde bebas. Shiva danzante. Hormigas suben por el pie de tu estatua. Hilos de araña enlazan tus cabellos al círculo del mundo, arco de fuego. Enmarañado, lleno de calaveras, bebes hormigas. En tu diestra un tambor, placer que salta. Crea su estruendo del universo que a un tiempo sostienes en la palma de la mano. Allí también el fuego que todo lo destruye. Vuelan cenizas donde tu danza se desata. La noche se pierde en el ojo de silencio de donde emanan palabras y criaturas. Queda tu paso en el bronce detenido Incendias hacia atrás toda memoria, hacia adelante toda expectación. Y en el presente puro, solo te soy, me eres. Los confines del mundo en las puntas de tu pelo enmarañado. Y para terminar, el vino. Basta una palabra, un giro del deseo para traer de pronto toda esta ebriedad. Vino que se decanta en gotas lentísimas, néctar, más sutil que el éter desciende al corazón. Y ahí, el sortilegio. Ebrios de Dios, mis ojos, ebrias, mis manos. Llenar la copa hasta los bordes, dicen. Tu rostro en todas partes, tu mirada embriagada. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Elsa. Thank you so much for the for, for the perfect ending to this poetry reading session. Before closing, though, I would uh, like to invite all the poets once again uh, to share their thoughts or impression, comments, if any, or if you'd like to ask anything to each another, like one another. I'd like to say that if there is one good thing this pandemia has left, it's the possibility of having these gatherings. It's amazing how close we can be, even through a screen. So I'm very happy and very grateful again for this invitation. Absolutely. We, right now we are from 
four different parts of the world, I think, <laughs> in a screen. <laughs> we, from India, from the US, from Texas, from New York, from Mexico City. It's absolutely amazing. And invoking places as diverse as uh, Varanasi and Jerusalem. And it's, uh, it's a journey, really. It's, you know, it's been quite a journey. It's quite amazing how intimate Zoom can actually be. Yes. You know, I had so many reservations about it earlier. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I'm from the Pacific Coast. I'm in, in Mazatlan. It's very uh, far. In Mazatlan. Yes, I am in Mazatlan, in front of the ocean. I've been here for one year already <laughs> in my house. I never leave house, but it's amazing how touching your poems of all of you were. It's yeah. been wonderful to share this with you and it's hope when I get in touch with good poetry and I think that makes a lot of sense in in life and somebody said poetry will save us is that the name of the <laughs> yeah I think these little moments can save us and thank you I'm really grateful to be here Thank mm -hmm. you.